Good morning. Scripture reading this morning will be from 1 Corinthians 3, verse 15, 5 through 17. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple, and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. You may be seated. It's a great blessing to be with you today. Thank you so much for your attendance. We have another good crowd here today. Steve asked me to remind one and all that as the construction of the building progresses, we're able to put more and more chairs in here. And I think now we're up to about 156 chairs. And these last three rows on this side, this would be the goat side, as Kirk Talley said, not me. Kirk said that's the goat side. The last three rows uh, are reserved for folks who want to wear their masks through the whole service. So uh, if you're staying at home because uh, you're afraid of getting infected and you'd like to be with us, but uh, you want to wear your mask the whole service, note that there are uh, a good number of people here today who are doing exactly that. And so we would invite you to come and uh, be with us. We don't want you to come if you're in one of those compromised groups. If you're over 65, diabetic, overweight, I'm describing myself all of a sudden, um, stay home and watch on YouTube. But we want to say welcome to all our YouTube folks as well. Steve, do we need to uh, get the able-bodied men to pick up the chairs like we did last week, stack them four or five at a time? Would, would that be helpful? Okay, so if you're an able-bodied man, uh, please hang around after worship and, and help us stack chairs. We have to get all this stuff cleared out, believe it or not, so that the construction guys can come in and finish what they're doing uh, this week or make further progress. Uh, as you can tell, the renovation of the building is uh, on schedule, and I think it's going great. I love the way the place looks. Very exciting to come in and see what they do week to week, to see the changes, and also witness the challenges. You may have noticed that we don't have a suspended projector this week. That's because when the construction guys were moving the scaffolding from over here to over here, they knocked the projector down, and it is no more. So we're in the process of buying a new projector. We're renting one for today. Uh, and it's working out. Sometimes these challenges have to be met on the fly, and I'm glad that we have able-bodied people who are willing to meet those challenges. And so as we watch the renovation of the church building progress, I think it's also time for us to implement a kind of renovation of the church. And the church is us, people, baptized believers, the community of God. From time to time, we need renovation as well because we can get stuck in some old ways and old ideas. We can get comfortable. Sometimes we even get a little lazy, don't we? I think we would admit to that. At least I will. Our life in Christ is a journey, a journey of growth into Christ-likeness. Jesus is the head of this body of people, and the body should Think like, look like, and act like the head of the body. And the way we become more like Jesus is by allowing 
the indwelling spirit to renovate our hearts, to, to transform our hearts to be more like the heart of Jesus. And so we're beginning a new sermon series today. For the next several weeks, we're going to dig into what the Spirit is actually doing inside of us, inside this church, the collective body, to renovate us into the spiritual house God wants us to become. Now, there are some challenges to overcome anytime we preach about the church because church means different things to different people. Over the course of the last 2,000 years, the church has a record that has been scrutinized, and rightly so. Various movements throughout church history speak to the fact that from time to time the church needs renovation. The church of Martin Luther's day looked nothing like the church of the first century. She had corrupt leadership who had introduced many unbiblical doctrines. Johannes Gutenberg invented the printing press started cranking out Bibles. People were able to read the scriptures for themselves, and as they did, they said, you know what? We're not doing what God wants us to do. And that gave birth to the Reformation movement in Europe. However, the Reformation movement's doctrine of justification by faith alone created a very individualistic kind of religion that resulted then in a whole lot of different denominations. Then in early America, long about the 19th century, people like Thomas Campbell and his son Alexander in Pennsylvania and Barton Stone in Kentucky said, all these different denominations need to unite in Jesus Christ upon the word of God. And many churches in the 19th century, including churches of Christ, regularly held revivals. Why? because the church needed reviving. Barton Stone himself led a revival of 20,000 people in Cane Ridge, Kentucky in 1801. Maybe they were wearing masks and standing six feet apart, I don't know, but that's a lot of people. Even today, there are many Christians who would say, you know what, the church needs to stand up and be heard. The church needs revival. We need renovation. Some of the other challenges in preaching about the church include a common view that, you know, I really don't need the church. Me and God got a good thing going on. I can follow him just fine on my own. Another view that says the church exists to serve me. I have needs. I pay my dues. I put my 20 in the plate, and I expect some benefits from that. And then there's the fact that today people are just much less likely to become a part of a group than they were, say, 30, 40 years ago. Most organizations, including most churches, have experienced a downturn in membership. More and more individuals and families seem to just want to be left alone. But I think the biggest challenge for the church is simply this, the growth of secularism. Our culture increasingly wants nothing to do with anything having to do with God at all. You want to worship God? That's fine. Just don't talk about him in public. You leave me out of the discussion. Get God out of my pledge allegiance. Get God off my money. Get God out of my kids' schools. That's the attitude we're seeing more and more and more of all the time. And so the church has a lot of challenges. And before we can preach to the masses, we first need to preach to ourselves. If we're going to be the people to renovate the world, we first must allow God to renovate us. There are a lot of folks attempting to redefine the church in our day and age. Some see the church as a corporation that exists only to improve assets and increase numbers and gain market share. Other people like to see the church as a, a theater venue, a place for entertainment. I'll go to the church and I will give to the church that best entertains me. A lot of that happening in our world today. Very few people see church for what it truly is. Folks, we are a community of the people of God and we are on God's mission. 
And the mission is to carry on the ministry of Jesus Christ, the ministry he began 2,000 years ago. See, somebody can stand up here week after week after week preaching, love God, love others, serve others all day long. We can preach, go and make disciples every week. But until we decide we're going to execute that mission, it's just words printed in a book or slapped on some banner. What does it mean to be the church? To find the answer to that question, we have to go to the writings of Paul. Paul writes to faith communities, just like us. And he asks them to think about their previous experiences in secular organizations and groups. Not once does Paul talk about making individual Christians. Instead, he talks about forming communities of people. And he challenges his hearers to differentiate between the church and all those other communities of the world. In a world full of different organizations and communities, what's the big deal about the church? Paul wants to answer that question. And it's very interesting that he does so by using prepositions. Paul says that believers have been baptized into Christ and died with Christ. And as a result, they now exist in Christ, in him and in the body of Christ. They are also of Christ. Additionally, Paul confirms that Christ or the Spirit dwells in believers. And by doing this, Paul is insisting that Christ and the church are inseparable. And most of the time, when Paul uses the word you in a letter to a church, it's a plural you. Not just y'all, but all y'all. And so as we sit here in the midst of the sawdust watching our church building being renovated, we need to be reminded that we, the people of the church, are being built into a house for God. We began our scripture reading, Chris did, with verse number 5. I'd like to go back and read verses 3 and 4 from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where Paul writes, Y'all are still of the flesh, for while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way for when one says I follow Paul and another I follow Apollos are you not being merely human in other words Paul is accusing these people of playing politics in the church I'm following Paul well I'm following Apollos they're acting like mere men people without the Holy Spirit spirit people without God they foolishly put men where only God should be having completely forgotten that God alone is sovereign. And so Paul has to put people, including himself and Apollos, in their proper place, which is kind of down here somewhere, so that he can then put God, exalt God to his proper place, which is so high above us. And to do that, he uses two metaphors from our text this morning. Two metaphors for the church. In verses 5 through 9, he declares that the church is God's field. Your version may say God's vineyard. A lot of you are gardeners. In the early spring, you till the ground, you plant the seed, you water it in, and then what do you do? You hope for the best, don't you? And some years, your garden is through the roof abundant. And you come to the church house bringing in these big baskets of zucchini and tomatoes and okra and peppers to share with everybody because you have an abundance. And yet other years, not so much. Why? Because your garden, as much as you think belongs to you, really belongs to God. The abundance of your garden is up to God. Sunshine and rain in just the right proportion. Not too much, not too little. And we always pray that that freeze, that last freeze has happened before we plant. Because we know those things are out of our hands. That 
that those things are up to the sovereign God of creation. It's the same way with the church. It's God's field. It's not Paul's field, not Apollos's. It's God's. And in the metaphor, Paul says, Apollos and me, we're just farm workers. Look again at verse 5. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you have believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but it was God who gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers And you, church, are God's field. See, you and I, as ministers in the Lord's church, are merely vine dressers in the vineyard of God. There's nobody in this body special. We're all equal in the eyes of God. And it ought to be that way in each other's eyes. The church in Corinth is playing politics. Paul is focused only on God. See, we live in a culture that likes to divide itself into camps, sheep and goats, Republicans and Democrats, rich and poor, educated, ignorant, black, white, male, female. We could go on and on. Paul says, no, those are all human communities which no longer bind us. We are now, by virtue of our faith and baptism, a part of God's house. We are God's community, and we are bound together by love for and faith in Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son. Paul says, me and Apollos, we're nothing. God's everything. All we did was plant and water. God's the one that brought the life. And Paul's not belittling his role in any way. It's an important role. Apollos' role is an important role. But compared to God's role, not much. Not much at all. Folks, here's the point. This is not your church. It's not Jim's church. It's not Scott's church. It's not Chuck's church. This is God's church, God's field, God's vineyard. Let's go back to chapter 1 of this same letter. Here's where Paul puts himself in relation to God. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Folks, the vineyard of God is no place for politics, and it's no place for pride. The church is unlike any community you've ever been a part of because it's God's community. The Corinthian church had a lot of problems. One of them was pride, boasting, arrogance, jealousy, division, because they were putting men where only God belongs. They failed to see the sovereignty of God. I pray that we don't make the same mistake. Let's see where we fit inside God's plan because it's God's plan. And then in the last half of verse 9, the metaphor changes. Paul says, y'all, the church are God's field. And the second metaphor, the church is God's temple building. If you'd like to write that down on your outline. Look at verse 10. According to the grace of God given to me, Like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds on it. Now, in that first metaphor, we said that Paul and Apollos were farmhands. In the second metaphor, they're construction workers. Paul was the first to come along. He's the one that laid the foundation. Apollos comes along later. He builds upon that foundation. Other preachers are coming in and adding to that foundation as well. And Paul warns them, you better be careful how you build. And so in one way, 
Corinth is really blessed that they have a lot of teachers. Not every church has that blessing. I've been members, a member of churches that uh, teacher recruitment was kind of like pulling teeth. I pray it's not that way here. Corinth has plenty of teachers. Paul says they better be careful. Why, Paul? Here's why. Verse 11. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He says, Corinth, you have a solid foundation. You have a quality foundation that will not move. So don't build a shoddy structure on that foundation. You build a solid structure, a quality structure that will stand up to God's final inspection. Why? Verse 13. Each one's work will become manifest for the day, and he's talking there about the last day, for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. You remember that James, Jesus' half-brother, says, not many of you should teach. Why? Because he says that teachers are going to be judged more harshly. Peter will tell us that on that last day, the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed, laid bare. Brothers and sisters of the faith, every teacher in this church, from the cradle roll to the preacher, is going to have their teaching exposed by God's fire on that last day. Verse 14, if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he'll receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Now, verse 15 there is one of those hard-to-understand verses with a lot of different interpretation, and I really don't want to lose focus of the lesson by going into all those different interpretations. I'm just going to tell you what I think it means. I think it's teaching that there are going to be degrees of reward in heaven, and I have no idea what that's going to look like. I've told you before, maybe it's going to be the size of your house, and I've told you that if I end up with a tough shed, I'll still be very happy and blessed. Maybe it's a better seat at God's table. We really don't know what that reward might be. But there are going to be some who are saved and their salvation will be their only reward. They will make it into God's presence. Barely. And I have to confess to you, there are a lot of days when that's me. I'm the guy that will barely get in. And it's on those days that I hit my knees and pray for God's abundant grace. Here's the real point of the metaphor. There's only one foundation. That's Jesus Christ. Jesus alone controls the shape and the quality of this church. Jesus is the preeminent king. He is the sustainer of all creation. Jesus is not just the one holding it up. He is the one who pervades it, pervades everything in his church. And so every teaching of every teacher in this church must bear the marks of Jesus. Every teaching of every teacher must exalt Jesus Christ to a place of true greatness. And gentlemen, let me remind you, That includes every prayer, every Lord's table talk, every song led in the worship of this congregation. That is why we prepare. That is why we practice. That's why we polish. It's why we perfect. Because we want our worship to God and the ministries of this church to be gold and silver that will not burn up instead of hay and wood and stubble. You see, the failure to exalt Jesus in this way results in injury to the church. 
people walk out of here in no way edified, but maybe confused or even beaten up. Let's all remember that we're part of the construction crew, not the demolition crew. We must always be building one another up in love. Division in the church is a horrible thing, and all it does is dishonor God and his son, Jesus Christ. And so those last two verses of our text are a warning that we need to hear. Paul says, do y'all not know that y'all are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and y'all are that temple. May we be vigilant to remember that we are God's, his field, his building, his temple. I pray that Jesus Christ is the foundation of this church and that the building blocks of our teaching fit squarely on that foundation. We are not people who do things our way. We do things God's way. And so I will ask you this morning, what work are you laying upon the foundation of Jesus here at Southern Hills? Is it a work consistent with Christ? Is it a work that benefits the whole body? A work that will not on the last day be burned up? Or maybe a better question is this. Are you laying anything on the foundation at all? Are you doing anything to benefit the body? The way I read the text, doing nothing is worse than laying a work that might be burned up on the last day. Peter says that each one of us is a living stone laid on the foundation of apostolic teaching where Christ is the chief cornerstone. As living stones in God's building, we are expected to contribute to the overall strength of God's house. And so maybe it's time for some of us to get busy. What's the primary motivation for contributing to the health of the body. Gratitude. Thankfulness for what Jesus has done for us. See, if Jesus' sacrifice doesn't really mean all that much to us, then nothing will motivate us. When we fully realize, and Frank, I appreciated your talk at the table this morning, when we fully realize what Jesus did for us at the cross, when we understand what Jesus has done to save us from eternal death, we're going to be so thankful that we just can't do enough. Not so we'll be saved, but because we are saved. We come to him in appreciation for all that he's done, and we serve Jesus in humility. We are God's vineyard, God's building God's temple. And maybe it's time for us to start living like it. At this time, Brother Chuck Meisenheimer is going to come and offer the shepherd's prayer as we are dismissed. Just wanted to remind all of you that next Sunday we set our clocks back one hour. So don't forget that. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Holy and righteous Father, as we sung today, you are the Holy One. We thank you, Father, for allowing us to be here to worship you to come to you in prayer to remember the great sacrifice that Jesus made for each of us. And Father, we continue to pray for this congregation, for those that 
have lost loved ones, for those that have moved away. And we pray for those that are sick or have cancer. Father, we also pray for those that are spiritually sick. And as we live in this world, Father, help us to be godly people as we tell others about you. Help us to remember that the church is your field and that we're bound together by your love and our faith in your word. Father, we are grateful that all the builders and contractors have done such a great job here on this building here in our own time. But the builder that we look forward to is Jesus Christ. And to him we say, your will be done. Thank you again, Father, for all that you have done for us. Continue to bless us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.